I'm Maureen Balatori, and this is season two of Spilled Salt, a podcast on the thrills and spills from the food, beverage, and agriculture industries. Today's guest is Sam L. Kane. He's an associate professor of dairy fermentation at Cornell University, but he also has experience in a couple of entrepreneurial ventures. Um, he also spent some time at Miller Coors and Unilever. And so today he talks about how his experience led him through um, corporate and then um, some education work and then going into higher education himself and the entrepreneurial kind of um, sidecars that he had along the way throughout that journey. He also talks about some tips for food, bev, and ag startups um, in the early days, some of the things that they can do that will help guide them. Um, and one of my favorite things, which is the pursuit of interesting. Enjoy the conversation. Thanks for joining me today. Yeah, happy to be here. Great. So I, um, I reached out to Sam to join us on the podcast today because he has a really interesting breadth of experience in the beverage industry and kind of a lot of different approaches to that. So Sam, I'd love to kind of have that be the focus of today's conversation, your various segments of work history. So if you can start us at some of the big name companies that you have experience with, I know you spent three years at Miller Coors and three years at Unilever. What was that like? What was, what was your work entailing there? Yeah. So yeah, well, I guess, yeah, we, we go back to the beginning. So and I'll start just like a little bit before uh, joining Miller. So I had originally been in, in Ithaca doing my master's in food science. I had started home brewing as an undergrad. A uh, friend's dad had kind of invited me over and I was like, oh, this is like a really cool version of microbiology that I wasn't learning anything about at school. Um, and I was like, oh, maybe, maybe I'll do that. So like I started looking at, you know, who did beer stuff. And then a lot of them had this degree in something called food science, which turns out I was at the University of Maryland and we had a food science program, but I didn't know anything about it. Right. I was a molecular biology grad. So I started applying to food science programs and luckily I got in here um, at Cornell and uh, I started here and uh, the lab I worked with was really focused on food safety, but I was learning a lot of the micro microbiology techniques and molecular bi biology techniques that I thought were going to be interesting in, for fermentation. And as I, as I got to the end of my degree, I was like, all right, I'm finishing my master's. Maybe I'd like to go do a PhD in beer, right? I, you know, uh, th this would be fun. I started talking to some other professors around the country that were beer professors. And they were telling me that, oh, well, you know, all these big brewing companies, they've cut their R&D departments. Nobody's doing research in beer anymore. Most of us don't even take PhDs. It's master students, and, and that's about what the industry needs. So I was like, all right, I guess my career in beer is not going to happen, right? So I came back to Cornell. I was like, well, maybe I'll stay and do wine. And then uh, kind of serendipitously, one of my friends who had graduated the year before um, started at Miller Brewing with her master's as a brewer. And called me up and said, "Hey, there's a R and D position here. Give me your give me your resume." So I handed her my resume, or emailed it to her, and uh, the next day they called me. They invited me out for wow. an interview the next week. I landed in Milwaukee. There were motorcycles parked in front of the airport. I had just learned to ride my motorcycle, and I was interviewing for beer. I was like, "How can this not be awesome?" <laughs> right. And so they they offered me the job, um, and I was like, "All right, well, forget. Let's forget about this PhD in wine." This is really what I want to do. This is a job that I was told that didn't exist, R&D, product development and brewing. Let's go do it. Um, and that's what I went to do with, uh, at the time, they were just Miller Brewing Company. Well, SAB Miller. Yep. Um, and really there, I, I did a lot of, so we had a, we have a pilot plant. They have a pilot plant. I guess I'm not there anymore. In, <laughs> in Milwaukee, um, they have a small 40 liter system, kind of like a home brew system, but it's like fully automated. And then they have like a large 10 barrel system, which kind of be like the size of your a typical craft brewery. Um, where we, you know, develop new beers. I research novel types of fermentations, different sugar profiles, right? How would we ferment those out? Uh, we did a lot of consumer research, white space kind of ideation, right? To kind of think of, you know, what was the next generation of beer? And really, a lot of the fermentation work, I was there, the, the director of, of microbiology there was always like, you know, you're getting your PhD in the lab here, right? Real yeah. world PhD. And, and really, I was. I, I learned a ton there. Um, uh, working with consumers and things like that. Eventually, we merged with um, with Coors, Molson mm -hmm. Coors, and then became Miller Coors. And at that time, that was probably about like two years into it, maybe. 
Um, and then with that merger, there was a lot of work around, you know, transferring, you know, Miller Light to the Coors Breweries, Coors Light to the, the Miller Breweries, figuring out how to brew that right. And there's a lot of packaging work, mm-hmm. which I'm a microbiologist. I'm a fermentation guy. I didn't really care for the packaging. So that kind of made me kind of lift up my head and say, hey, what, you know, what else is going on out there? Um, and so uh, I happened to get an email uh, from a, a headhunter who was looking for a microbiologist to do food safety for a large ice cream company. And, and so I had done food safety for my master's. So I said, all right, well, you know, let's at least, you know, I'll interview for this position. Let, let's see, see what happens. And it turns out it was with Unilever uh, out in just outside New York City at their Englewood Cliffs uh, headquarters there in New Jersey. And basically, funny enough, you know, I, I being in Wisconsin, they were moving their ice cream group from Green Bay, Wisconsin hmm. out to New Jersey. And nobody really wanted to make the move because of the cost of living. So they were really rebuilding their team. And so uh, they were looking for somebody with, you know, food safety background to kind of really come back in, review the legacy uh, food safety, you know, plans and practices that they had in place for the North American ice cream business, and then kind of bring that up to speed and then work with the plants. And that's, I was like, oh, let's go to New York. Let's see what that is. So moved to New York City and, uh, and then really, you know, work there. Uh, reviewing food safety, working with suppliers, with new product development, eventually got into helping commissioning plants um, to kind of bring those up to speed, right, from a, a hygiene and food safety perspective. And and that's kind of what my, my role was then at, at Unilever, much more that's food great. safety than product development focus. Right. Gotcha. So would we recognize anything that you worked on back from your Miller Coors days that's that's on shelf now or has been on shelf between the time you worked on it? Yeah. So, you know, some of the projects that I touched, we, we touched some of the lining Kugels uh, projects there. I touched there. What we had a little bit of work on Miller chill. Uh, I did a lot of like background work on, um, I don't know if you remember sparks, which was uh, launched by McKenzie river through Miller. And then Miller eventually bought sparks. It was a caffeinated alcoholic beverage. Hmm. Right. Yeah. Um, and, uh, eventually they had to pull the caffeine out, but, um, and, and then a lot of the work I did was really the, the basis of fermentation that became the platform for a lot of the hard seltzers today. Right. So understanding, you know, how to control those sugar brews, what were the right types of yeasts, also the regulatory environment around that. Cause back, back when I was at Miller, you know, the understanding was that you had to have malt to be considered mm-hmm. a beer. Uh, but it turns out it wasn't strictly true. And so, you know, we wrote a docket, helped write a docket for TTB and kind of got them to say, hey, no, actually, that 25 percent thing is not really a set rule. And so then we were able to really develop bases that didn't have a lot of color that came from the malt. Right. Yep. To make then a neutral or very neutral mm. base um, that could be used for these kind of products. Got it. Well, and I'm sure we'll come back to that neutral base in some of your yeah. later experience, yeah. yes. because certainly I know that that led to some other um, entrepreneurial work that you pursued. Um, I just have to put this joke in there. Like I also got a PhD in beer in college, but mine looked a little different than <laughs> yours. <laughs> just, when you said PhD yeah. in beer, that has a totally different meaning. <laughs> For me, um, hey, uh, you know, taste, <laughs> tasting and appreciation and consumer sensory is all right. And marketing a beer is all also right. It's own, <laughs> its own degree. So. That's right. That's right. So if anybody needs an, an expert taster, uh, call Sam and then call me, <laughs> <laughs> call me next. Um, so you, you spent some time in food safety, microbiology, new product development for these large brands. And then what happened? So what made you kind of take a sharp left turn from that? Yeah, well, yeah, so it was kind of a little serendipity. So what ended up happening was as I was working for Unilever, I had my master's degree and in in the the food safety world, um, a lot of people have PhDs. And so I I kind of hit this ceiling, you know, where Mm. my boss is like, you'd be really great to move up, but you don't you don't have a PhD. And uh, I went to interview with another company and they offered me a position in their food, their food safety group. But when it came time to negotiate salary, uh, they were like, well, you know, we can't pay you more than our PhDs. And so I was like, well, why am I going to jump ship, you know, start a whole new, you know, they call a new network. Why not go back and get my PhD? And so, um, you know, again, uh, looking at uh, one of the, the stories I always tell my, my students is, you know, 
how people you meet through your life uh, impact you later on and the, the yeah. important network. So uh, the person who was interviewing me for that position was on the, the interview committee. When I sent them the letter, said, I'm turning you down and I'm, I'm going to go go do my going to go look to do my Ph.D. He called an old friend of ours because we had done our master's together at Cornell and a friend of ours had done his Ph.D. here, Sam Nugent. And he was now at UMass as a professor. He called up Dr. Nugent and said, hey. Sam Alkin just rejected me for a job, said he's looking to do a PhD. You might want to talk to him. Yeah. And Sam called me and said, I heard you're looking to do a PhD. I'm looking for a, a PhD student with uh, some molecular biology experience. And so that's what wow. led me going to, to UMass and, and joining uh, the Nugent lab there and, and starting some work on, you know, there we were looking at engineering these viruses called bacteriophage, they infect bacteria and engineering them so that they could more rapidly help us detect whether or not a, a bad bacteria was in your water or food. So really mm. detection systems. And, Interesting. Uh, yeah. I think the, it's a, I'm glad you mentioned that some of this is the people that you meet, right? Mm. And so the audience for this podcast is a lot of early stage food bev ag folks that are, you know, kind of looking to grow what they're doing. And so I say that all the time too, that networking is half of your growth, you know, and that you should always nurture relationships and you never know where something might lead. And so for you, it led to right. your led PhD to, 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 and another, you know, rung on the ladder time. and right. yeah, yeah, yeah. In terms of your growth. Yeah. Okay. So you did, you did your did PhD, the, right. checked the box, then what happened? Check the box. Yeah. So then again, it's always, uh, it's always serendipity. So, you know, when I came back to do the PhD, my plan was, you know, I was going to come back, recenter, and then either I was going to come back to academia or not to academia. I was going to go back to to industry or I was going to go kind of maybe work for a government agency or nonprofit. I was really interested also some of the work that the World Health Organization and the Food and Ag Organization did. And so I did an internship with them while I was doing my Ph.D. But then when I came back from that internship and talking about network, my old professor here at Cornell that I did my master's with reached out and said, hey, uh, we have a position that's opening up. Uh, it's looking for a dairy fermentation person uh, who, you know, they're going to do research and extension. So industry outreach, not typical lectures. It's like, you know, you have some of that experience in fermentation, dairy food safety, you should consider applying. And I was kind of like, it's kind of early. And he's like, well, apply. You know, if you get the interview, you at least learn what the interview process is like for academia. Yep. And, uh, and you know, you can see where it goes from there. And so... Uh, and I, you know, it was kind of funny when he called because I had had a, I remember distinctly having a conversation with my wife when I was going originally back for my PhD and she was like, would you ever go back to academia? I was like, well, there's not many places where I would go. And I was like, I'll never end up at a place like Cornell, right? Mm. Well, lo and behold, right, we went through the interview process and I got the offer for an assistant professor uh, position here. Uh, and so I was like, all right, how can I pass up this this huge opportunity? It hadn't been what I originally was, was planning for. Um, but it was hard to say no to the idea of getting my own lab and an opportunity to kind of push some of the research that I was interested in. Yeah. So um, that's ended up, that's how I ended up here at Cornell it was kind of, you know, you, you can never plan for an academic position someplace uh, to open up when, when you need yeah. it. And yep. so it, it was a bit of luck of the draw. Yeah. But that's what then landed me, landed me here at Cornell. Yeah, that's great. Um, and so I, th I think one of the things that's that I say a lot in the talks that I give is about this concept of the pursuit of interesting is yeah. what I call it. So you've mentioned that a couple times, you know, that you were well, I was interested in fermentation. And so I pursued the Miller Coors opportunity. And then, you know, I kind of had this Cornell interest, but, you know, didn't really know that it was going to pan yeah. out. Well, here you are. Yeah. Right. And so I think that there's something to be said for reflecting on and paying attention to the things that you're interested in to be able to pursue that right. path. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. You and know, go ahead. you've got to be inspired by, you know, interests. It's, you know, and, but the other thing I, you know, I try to remind people too, is like at some point you realize that maybe something isn't working out for you. Right. And you need, mm. and you got to have, it's scary to change it up and then change. Right. Um, and, and it's, I think it's worse to get stuck. Right. Because then you're totally. in a job that you don't like. You're not being motivated. And, you know, you got to you got to take the leap sometimes and recognize when you need to take the leap. Right. So, yeah. you know, it was, you know, a little concerning to jump from, you know, 
doing beer, which is what I, you know, I was doing beer. This is what I loved. And then yeah. I was, you know, oh, you're going to go do food safety for an ice cream company. Right. But it's like, but it was, I went there and I learned a ton. Right. And then going back for my PhD, going from a high salary to a, a grad student salary. I, I was married. I had just had, we just had our first kid. Right. And it was a, a, a bit of a leap to know where that was going to lead to. Cause you, you don't always know. Um, right. But, but you, you, you gotta, you gotta push. Right? Yeah. Uh, one of my favorite quotes is proceed as if success is inevitable. And so when you move forward with the understanding, you know, another common one, like jump in the net will appear, yeah. right? That if you hadn't taken that shift to go pursue your PhD, who knows what you would be yeah. doing now. But, you know, I think that that is excellent advice to pay attention to when you're stuck and yeah. kind of, you know, it, you can't even say don't be afraid to take the leap because it is scary. It's a, yeah. it's a scary thing to make yeah. big adjustments like that, yeah. especially when you have other life circumstances yeah. going on. But I think that the the trick to that is paying attention to what the universe is telling you, yeah. you know, yeah. and you realized that you wanted to keep growing and, and expanding the work that you were doing and you were only going to be able to go so far with that without your PhD. And so right. like it kind of made sense to take that direction right right yeah yeah sometimes it's easy even sometimes it, it's you're taking a leap but also it sometimes feels like the universe is like kind of pulling you in another direction you got to follow that flow right yeah. totally yeah. totally agree and yeah. a lot of that comes from on our first season of the podcast we had a guest maria cast who spoke about how to kind of help yourself listen to when the universe is kind of trying to send those messages to you if you're not one that tends to you know, hear yourself in that way, right? That you just, there's some people tend to feel stuck and they stay stuck, right? right? Instead of feeling stuck and using that as a message, hearing yeah. it as a message it from the universe, right? Yeah. Of I need to make a change. So in that, in that work experience that you just explained, you had two co-founder positions, right? So talk oh. a little bit about your entrepreneurial experience as well. Yeah. So, you know, again, I've, I've always, there's always things that interest me, ideas, right? Things that, that, that tickle. So um, a couple things happened. All right. So while I was starting up here at Cornell and over, even though I had left Miller course, right? And when I was there, I was always interested in, you know, again, non-traditional fermentations, right? So like neutral base brews. It's also really interested. I'm, um, my parents are from Latin America. My dad's from El Salvador. My mom's Cuban. Um, and always interested in what was the the, the fermentation traditions, um, right, in, in those countries and, and in Latin America. And so I had, uh, you know, ordered in a lot of products. Uh, there, are, there are these polques, which are kind of fermented from agave nectar. They're very popular in Mexico. There's a really vibrant scene in Mexico City with these. Um, and then there's chichas, um, which are kind of from, you know, the Andes Mountains, Peru, Colombia, which are... Um, you know, made from corn, right? That, you know, sometimes they, the corn may be masticated to break down the starches or it's malted and mm -hmm. then used to brew. And I always thought there was, there was a potential there um, to make some interesting, you know, kind of modernize, reinvent, you know, build on that, that tradition um, from Latin America. And so I had, while I was working at Unilever, I had started buying in um, corn, malting it in my apartment, <laughs> and then drying it and then making chichas. And I was, I'd been sending it to an old friend that I had used to work with at Miller who was on the marketing side of things. And, you know, hey, you know, try this, try this, try this. And, oh, this is cool. You know, this is good. And uh, he had it left Miller, ended up working, I think it was for Boulder Beer as their director of marketing for a few years. And then left Boulder Beer right around the time I was starting my PhD. And, um, and uh, well, yeah, a little after I started my PhD. Well, White Run, I was about to start at Miller. And it was like, I want to go start a brewery. And, you know, you've been sharing this, this chicha stuff with me. I'd really like to do something like this. Let's come up with a, a concept. And that kind of led to the development of Dos Luces, Two Lights, right? Which is kind of then inspired by, you know, the history of corn, right, in, in the Americas and the history of, of agave, those two brews. And also him and I, right, as kind of, yeah. you know, kind of thinking about, about what that was. And so then um, now he was in Denver. Uh, right. Huge brewing scene. And I was just starting off here in Ithaca, so I couldn't, you know, go over there all the time. But then he kind of ran, you know, developed uh, right, the right, the brewery, the concept, and really then started taking those prototypes 
refining them and then brewing them on, on a larger scale and really developed, uh, you know, uh, beverages that were really, really unique, really world class and, you know, well, well lauded in the industry. So, yeah, that was Dos Luces. Um, so that and, and then, then. <laughs> and then right again, because I can't I can't uh, I have difficulty saying no to, to my my own idea. So at the same time, I was doing my, my lab work here. So um, serendipitously, when when again, when I was here, um, the focus on dairy fermentations, New York State. Um, through the Department of Environmental Conservation came to Cornell and was like, hey, you know, we're the largest yogurt producing state in the country. You know, we've got, you know, Chabane, Faye, we've got all these large Greek yogurt producers and they make this thing called, you know, acid whey. They say they can't do anything with it. They're, they're throwing it away. Some of it's going to farms, some of it's going to wastewater, some of it's going to land. We don't quite know everything, but it seems like a big problem. Can you guys come up with some research? And just to add one thing yeah. to that for anybody who's not aware, when Sam says they make a thing called whey, yeah. whey is the byproduct of the yogurt production. Of the Greek yogurt. When you yes. strain that yogurt, right, to get that thicker Greek yogurt compared to like a traditional like Danon or, or something like that. Um, what's left behind is this kind of like neon green liquid and it's called whey. And we just happen to call it acid whey for, for yogurt because it's a lower pH, but it's really it's not that, that acidic compared to like a beer or a wine. It, it's not that acidic, but it's acidic compared to milk. But yeah. So the question was, what do we do with that? And so obviously me starting off, me being, you right, having come from the brewing world, it was like, well, you know, all right, what's in this? And there was a lot of lactose. There was no protein because the protein stayed with the uh, with the yogurt, um, and there were a lot of minerals, right? And so I knew I was like, hey, what are we doing brewing? We take sugar, we make ethanol, right? Let, let's see what's going on here. And then in those white space, you know, ideation meetings, there was always talk about, you know, how do we make a better for you beer, right? Mm -hmm. Like, you know, we had the low carb thing. You know, we've always talked about, well, you know, could you add electrolytes? What other ingredients could you add? But it was always, right, um, a tough proposition because you're adding it in intentionally, right? But this, right. right, the minerals in whey are naturally there, right? It's got great, excellent source of calcium, magnesium, potassium, all these things. So I was like, all right, well, let's see what we can ferment this into and how does it taste, right? And so, and then, you know, in my side of the lab was also what interesting yeast could we do from a microbiology perspective, which is a little bit more, you know, specific but we started then fermenting it with different yeasts and trying it and you know some of it was funky but some of it you know i'm a kombucha guy i was like wow you know this is kind of interesting there, there's something here right now maybe if we apply some of the the product development and processing techniques that we used back in the days at miller we can make a more palatable base and started started working on then you know taking the microbiology applying the processing to see what what we could do and, you know, eventually I had some cool people pass through the, the lab. I had uh, early on, I had Steve Hindi, who was one of the founders of Brooklyn Beer, come through the lab and I had him taste some of the early prototypes. And he's like, he's like, I would drink this. I think my wife would drink this. This is pretty cool stuff, right? And so that was kind of encouragement that there was an opportunity here uh, to yeah. run with. So then as I got these prototypes, I was like, all right, well, you know, my job at the university is to then translate, you know, research to industry. So I started meeting with dairy companies and say, hey, let, you know, taste this, this prototype that I had. And everyone was like, oh, well, this is, you know, it tastes interesting, tastes good. But they're like, but it's like a whey alcohol. Like, you know, how do we talk about this with consumers? We, you know, would this even sell? Right. Mm -hmm. And then uh, even even talking to my old friends at Miller, like, again, it tastes interesting. But but how do you build a market around this? Right. Mm -hmm. So it's like, OK, well, let me, let's go back to the lab. So then um, I uh, ended up working with a. A local brewer, uh, it was called Bandwagon Brewing. Um, they were out of Inner Lake in New York. And uh, so I convinced uh, the owner there, uh, Michael Johnson, to uh, let me do a small three barrel brew there of the way and just put it, have him put it on tap, right? Yeah. And so uh, we put it on tap and uh, people bought it, right? You know, we'd, we'd blend up different flavors each week and people would pay $5 for a pint and some people would come back and order a second one, right? And so it's like, aha. <laughs> here's the, there, there's some people interested in this right they're paying five dollars for a pint right there's so i went back out with this information uh well went again to some dairy companies and uh they're like oh it's still interesting but yeah we, we don't know sam we still think it's kind of a far out out there so that's kind of where i kind of got to this wall where i was like all right if i'm going to really be able to show that there's a path here i'm going to have to really try to take this maybe out to market on my own mm -hmm. and um and that's kind of where that started and along that way then 
Um, I had met a, a, a guy uh, about my age, Tristan Sandvoss, who had uh, started his own uh, business. He started a, a goat creamery called First Light um, that he started with his brother and a few goats, and he grew it to a nationally distributed brand. I had actually met him because on my, you know, my Cornell food safety hat, I, te- I taught classes to cheesemakers around food safety and he'd come through and taken a few of those courses mm. and he was, you know, really top notch, you know, as far as the, the students that I had coming to that class, he was very well prepared, you know, very focused on food safety. And I was like, all right, you know, he knows what he's doing. And I had shared some early prototypes with him and he was like, Hey, if you're looking to, to launch this, you know, I'd be happy to help. And at that time he had sold some of his business to old Chatham Creamery mm. and was working there at the time. Um, and this was kind of, just before COVID hit, right? Right. And I was like, hey, there's this competition called Grow New York. I want to put together, I put I put a small application a year before and they're like, oh, well, you're just by yourself. You know, you're not a large enough company. You know, you need a team. So it's like, let's try applying for it this year. So mm-hmm. uh, COVID hit, had some time, right? We wrote up an application and we, we submitted it to, to the Grow New York competition and we got accepted as, as one of the finalists. And at the same time, because we had applied to Grow New York, we applied to Fuse Hub um, and we're, we're also selected as one of the, the finalists for that competition. And that's what kind of then laid the groundwork for, for yep, all yep. of that. Yeah. Yep. For some great momentum. Yeah. yeah. That's, that's great. I think the key takeaway for all of our listeners here today is that it's okay to do more than one thing, yep. right? I mean, you've shown that kind of dabbling in a lot of different areas, as long as you're kind of holding tight to where your interest lies Mm -hmm. and kind of following, you know, that path, that it's okay to do multiple things along the way. And that, like you said, you never know who you're going to meet and who you're going to be connected to that's going to lead you to the next thing, you know? Mm -hmm. So, I mean, as shown by both your entrepreneurial ventures, as well as your corporate experience Mm -hmm. and in higher ed. Um, so just in closing, how, what can you talk like briefly about your current work in dairy fermentation at Cornell and, um, and if, you know, there's any listeners of the podcast here today that could leverage your experience in right. terms of making a new connection in you, um, what should people call you for these days? Yeah. So, yeah. So, you know, kind of building, I don't think I even, Norway, right, was the, the product that we launched is, you know, now it's an alcoholic beverage and, and all that kind of stuff. So I do a lot of work right now on, you know, using different types of yeast to transform dairy into novel products, whether it's alcoholic products, whether it's kombucha type products, whether it's new types of cheeses, new types of uh, nutritional powders and things like that. How do we leverage that fermentation control? And I, and they're right uh, a vast array of different types of products that, you know, people could take the research that we're doing on in the lab, right? This is publicly funded research and it's there for people to leverage, right? To then develop new products. Uh, and then the other side of things that I do, again, I do a lot of food safety work for the dairy industry. And so, you know, seeing your product on shelf and, you know, hearing people that they love the taste and it's a novel process and they like that is great, but you also want to make sure that you're making something that doesn't kill somebody. And right. so there's that balance of understanding, right? Having the excitement of product development, but then understanding what those risks are and the types of products you're developing and how do you control those risks? And so I, I can kind of help on both sides of that equation uh, when it That's comes fantastic. to you know, And I love that your, your role brings together so much of your past experience too in research and development, in fermentation, in food safety, and really is the culmination of all of that. Are you loving your work? Yeah, I know. Every day I, I get to do something different, right? Some days I get, I get to talk about it. Some days I get to spend it in the lab. Some yeah. days I'm going out to a, a factory to help troubleshoot a problem. And so, right, it's what, again, I like to to have different things coming in out. Some people are maybe more focused, right? But uh, for me, having having multiple irons, right, and being able to pull one out, see how it's doing, and then put it back in is is, is a fun thing. Yeah. And in that vein, too, you're judging the national ice cream competition, too, right? Yes, right. So yeah, we we are collaborating with uh, the North American uh, Ice Cream Association, and they have a, a huge company. They have their convention coming up at the start of November, and uh, they have an ice cream clinic where um, all these companies can submit whether it's their uh, vanilla, chocolate, or strawberry ice cream gets submitted to us here at Cornell. We put it in front of an expert sensory panel, 
and they they judge them for defects, right? And so you get points off if there's defects. And if you have a if you got you got a great ice cream, you get a high score and you get a blue ribbon. And if you get three blue ribbons over the course of a couple of years, uh, you become a grandmaster, an ice cream grandmaster, which is a which is a huge accomplishment. And so we are in the middle of tasting those ice creams. We, we had the hugest uh, submission of ice creams this year that we've had. We've been doing this uh, in collaboration with Nike for the past three years, and this has been the biggest uh, submission. So there's a lot of ice cream. <laughs> a lot of ice cream to taste, which I'm sure from my perspective sounds great, right? That you get to just eat a bunch of ice cream. But I imagine, you know, you don't have to get too far into it to some ready to not be tasting it. Is still, people fight to be on, to go through the training, to be on that, that sensory panel. So it is a lucrative position here at, at Cornell. Wow. That's great. That's great. Well, Sam, thank you so much for your time and for joining me today. I appreciate you sharing your background and kind of giving some tips to the listeners in terms of some ways to pay attention to the messages that the universe is trying to send. So if it's all right with you, when we share the recording of this podcast, I'll share your contact information in the show notes yeah, so course. that people can contact you yeah. for all things fermentation, yeah. ice cream, beer. Reach out. That's what that's what I'm here for. At Cornell is as a resource to help people, you know, ferment ferment the next generation of product. Thank you for listening to Spilled Salt. I'm Maureen Bellatori. For more information about the podcast, visit www.agency-29.com. If you have questions for me or you'd like to recommend a guest for a future episode, you can send a message using the contact form on the website. Like and subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts so you never miss an episode.